everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, and we are very happy tonight to be presenting Professor Ann J. Cruz. She's going to be discussing her new book, The Life and Writings of Luisa de Carvajal y Mendoza, and Professor Pamela S. Hammonds. She'll be discussing her new book, Book M, A London Widow's Life Writings. We're happy to be presenting this event in collaboration with the University of Miami Center for the Humanities. And here to introduce tonight's speakers, please welcome to the microphone the director of the center, Professor Miyoko Suzuki. Thank you. So today I get to introduce the speakers myself. I usually have to introduce someone else to um, introduce the speakers, but today I'm uh, taking it upon myself to introduce the speakers because they're very close colleagues of mine uh, in early modern studies. So um, the two books, yes, yeah, sorry, the two books that uh, will be presented tonight are both part of a distinguished series concerned with historical recovery, the other voice in early modern Europe. This series was initiated at the University of Chicago Press by Margaret King and Albert Rabel, Jr., and in its first iteration, published 60 volumes by and about early modern women, including religious history and devotional writing, essays on economic equality and female autonomy, anatomy and medical treatises, philosophical and scientific works, and imaginative literature, including memoir, fiction, drama, and lyric and epic poetry. The, the series then moved to the Center for Reformation and Renaissance Studies at Victoria University in the University of Toronto. King and Raybill continue as editors of the uh, European texts, and the English texts are now edited by Elizabeth Hageman. The Toronto series has published 35 volumes to date. Our first presenter, Anne Cruz, editor of the life and writings of Luisa de Caravajal y Mendoza, 1566-1614, is professor of Spanish and Cooper Fellow in the Arts and Sciences at the University of Miami. She has published extensively on picaresque literature, Petrarch's poetry, Cervantes, and women's writings. Her two latest editions of essays, Women's Literacy in Early Modern Spain, Spain and the New World, and Early Modern Habsburg Women, received prizes for best collaborative projects from the Society of the Study of Early Modern Women. Anne is co-editor of Early Modern Women, an interdisciplinary journal, and editor of the Ashgate series, New Hispanisms, Cultural and Literary Studies. She was recently elected member of the Institute of European Court Studies, and is corresponding member of the Royal Academy of History in Spain. Please welcome Anne Cruz. Books and the Center for the Humanities and my good colleague, Miyoko Suzuki, for inviting both my colleague Pam Hammonds and me to share our research on two early modern women who, as you'll hear from our talks, have quite a lot in common despite their obvious differences. The Spanish noblewoman Luisa de Carvajal, my woman, born, <laughs> in, <laughs> born in 1566, was undoubtedly one of the most controversial figures of early modern Spain. We know of her life Thanks to, the, thanks to the paper trail that she created. She wrote an, uh, an autobiography. She has hundreds of letters and even some uh, spiritual poetry. As an adult, she refused to marry or become a nun. Instead, she left an ascetic life, sweeping the streets and feeding the poor. And the image on the PowerPoint is the idea that most people still have had of her as a pious religious woman. But what was most extraordinary about Luisa de Carvajal is that at 39 years of age, she made the decision to leave Spain for England as a self-appointed missionary with the intention of converting the Anglicans to Catholicism. That she made such an unprecedented voyage was no doubt due to her aristocratic family connections. 
On her mother's side, she was a Mendoza, a member of one of the most important noble families in Spain. Her father was the son of the powerful and wealthy Bishop of Plasencia. And this is how I would like, whoops, I went too far. Okay, this is how I'd like you to envision her. Um, what, most, what most opened doors for her travel to England was the donation of her inheritance to the Jesuits, who for the longest time had supported the English Catholics' resistance to Anglican uh, rule. This was an inheritance that she had to fight for. Because she did not marry or enter a convent, her brother claimed her dowry, so she took her brother to court which had at that time moved from Madrid to Valladolid. There she met an English Jesuit who became her confessor and traveled with her to England. Her timing, however, was unfortunate because she arrived in London six months before the gunpowder plot, which, <laughs> which the English are celebrating today on November 5th. And I have to thank my historian friend for pointing that out to me. During the mo almost 10 years that she lived in London, she was persecuted by the Anglicans and twice jailed for what were considered insurrectional acts, and both governments wanted her to return to Spain. Luisa fell ill, however, and died in London on her birthday in 1614 at 48 years of age. As tumultuous as her life was in England, Luisa's first decades in Spain proved equally traumatic. Her childhood began with great promise, she tells us that as an only daughter, she was spoiled by her parents. She loved nothing more than to sit on a high table and have the household servants bow to her. This apparently innocent desire for attention, which we may attribute to her privileged childhood, was considered by the adult Luisa as a willful imperiousness that she felt she had to control. When she was six years old, her, both her parents died, and from then on she lived a disrupted family life that included four years uh, with King Philip's, uh, Philip II's daughters at the Madrid court. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah. Where her great aunt was tutor to his children. When, his, when this aunt died, she was sent to Almazan, a small town in northeast Spain, in the care of the family of her uncle, the Marquis of Almazan, who at the time was the Spanish ambassador to the Holy Roman Emperor in Vienna. Nothing, however, could have prepared her for the ordeal she would experience when her uncle returned. According to Luisa's autobiography, the Marquise meant to instill in the 14-year-old what she calls a perfect obedience and negation of my will, which he said was the root of a million evils. Her graphic account of what the uncle makes her undergo is sufficiently chilling to place in doubt his pious intentions. One of the issues most debated by critics when interpreting Carvajal's life remains the corporal discipline given her by two servants contracted for this purpose by her uncle. She narrates how a servant would take her to a distant room, and I quote, and entering and locking the doors with a severe and somber look, she would command me to uncover my shoulders and disrobe to the waist. She would flagellate me as long as she wished with such well-aimed blows that at times I could hardly stand them. And so as not to show my pain, I had to press my hands together or tighten them into fists. I was so ashamed and deeply mortified by my nudity that my face surely turned as pale as if I were dead. This was so excellent a practice of humility that it both enriched me and increased my disillusion of the world. Critics have asked whether these practices might have constituted incest or sexual abuse. My own caution when reading this passage is that it needs to be historicized within the period of the Counter-Reformation, when corporal discipline formed part of spiritual development. This is not to dismiss the real physical abuse that the young girl suffered. The efforts to write this episode, which in the autobiography is fragmented and repeated several times, exemplify the manner uh, in which, according to recent studies, one may deal with traumatic experience. For Luisa de Carvajal to narrate these practices some 20 years after the fact was to relive them in their most explicit and painful details in order to communicate to her confessor her desire to imitate Christ's passion. Corporal discipline for this purpose was not new to Catholic Europe. 
It served the purpose of expiating sin. But because Christ's suffering was not solely an act of redemption, but one of choosing to suffer, Luisa explains that she continued to flagellate herself so harshly that the sores became infected and the towel she placed on her back to absorb the blood could only be removed with scissors, pulling pieces of flesh with it and causing her great pain. Her response to the discipline her uncle imposed on her then was to accept it so fully that she molded herself to the demands of the extreme religiosity of the period. By means of her penitential practices, she reached an exceptional level of spiritual and social self-assertion that strengthened her, her resolve in attaining her wishes. Ever since she was a child, she tells us in her autobiography, her major wish was to die a martyr for the Catholic cause. News of the executions of English Catholics had been circulating since Henry VIII's reign. When Elizabeth I came to the throne, numerous Catholic priests were martyred, including Edmund Campion in 1581. I just want to point out that if, uh, the, the symbolism around uh, on, on uh, Campion, the, the noose and the knife uh, explains how he died. Uh, he was, as, as you'll hear about mo everybody at the time, they were, they were um, uh, hanged, drawn, and quartered. And so that, those, that's what's going on on this side over here. However, in among the more than 200 letters that she wrote while in England, and they were long letters. I've translated several, and uh, some of them are you know, five pages long. We read that her original plans were to go to Flanders to found a, con a convent. In 1600, she writes to a friend at the court of Philip II's daughter, Isabel Clara Eugenia, who you, who you saw as a child, and who is now the Archduchess of the Netherlands. Your Grace, please ask Her Highness if she would like for me to build a convent for Spanish women at my cost as I have been told that she was very pleased with one recently founded at that court for English ladies. When the friend did not support her plans, she offered her inheritance to the Jesuits if they could help her leave Spain. With the money, they built a novitiate in Flanders. Luisa left Spain in January of, 50, of 1605 with her confessor and several other companions on muleback to save what a coach would have cost. The Jesuits backed her voyage as much for political as for financial reasons. In 1604, England had signed a peace treaty with Spain, yet the Jesuits claimed the legitimate ascendancy of Philip II's daughter, of Isabel Clarogenia, to the English throne, a claim, that, uh, a claim supported by Carvajal, but not Isabel Clarogenia, who said, I don't want to be Queen of England. <laughs> On her arrival with little money, continuously ill, and unable to speak the language, she spent most of the time in the countryside in English recusants' homes. During that first year, the, gun the gunpowder plot's failure brought on increased Catholic oppression with the execution of one of its traitors, Guy Fawkes. And here we have Guy Fawkes. Once she learned the language, she found she could visit the Catholic priests imprisoned in the London jails. She also felt sufficiently empowered to preach Catholic doctrine out of doors. Her ambiguous status in England became downright dangerous due to her close alliance with the English Jesuits. She was seen as a disorderly woman who preached publicly like a man and in fact was declared a Roman priest in woman's clothing. Her public appearances breached the English statute against any speech or writing that affirmed or promoted any foreign jurisdiction, spiritual or ecclesiastical. The third offense to this was regarded as high treason and it meant torture and death. Luisa's boldness in carrying out illegal activities derived not only from her religious zeal, but from her forceful personality and strength of will, shaped and sustained by her class status. No threat against her held her back. Her openness in declaring her opposition to Anglicanism led to her first imprisonment in 1608. She explains in a letter that she was stopped on the street and sent to jail where she spent four days being questioned for hours on her religious beliefs until the Spanish ambassador was able to have her released. Luisa sought out opportunities for her own martyrdom, but until that time, she still had to pay her bills. She wrote often to friends and acquaintances in Spain, something like us too, okay, asking for donations. She repaid them by sending the relics of English priests' remains 
that she first collected and prepared. The Catholic cult of relics had come under, under, under attack, although the Council of Trent defended the moral dignity invested in saints' bodies. The recovery of body parts became for Luisa an exhilarating and justified activity in its own right, as it placed her in greater danger and thus one step closer to martyrdom. <laughs> in a letter to a relative, she describes how she was asked to collect the bodies of two priests who had been hanged, drawn, and quartered. They always place the martyrs' heads on the tower, and they bury the bodies next to the gallows in a very deep and wide hole, and much dirt has to be removed. We received orders to steal them, or better, to take our treasure. The Catholics brought a horse to carry the saints, and cloth saddlebacks made from our sheets. I waited for a signal from them at 4 a.m., and when it didn't come, I was sorely worried until 6 in the morning when the bodies were brought to our house. That night, Carvajal and her companions washed the mud and waste from the body parts. To keep them from decomposing, the parts were anointed with uh, aromatic spices and sealed in lead containers for a year before sending them abroad. Luisa's tra transgressions occurred at the same time as the situation against Catholics worsened. She states in a letter that persecution is the strongest I've seen in six years. Even women and ladies are persecuted regardless of their social position. They have tried so hard to catch me that they have t attempted to do so at my own house. There are so many Catholics in Newgate that we fear the majority will die from illness this summer. During the last two years of her life, she wrote often to one of the most important politicians at the Spanish court, Rodrigo Calderón. He was the favorite of the king's favorite, the Duke of Lerma. Calderón was married to Luisa's cousin, and when his power at court began to decline, she served as his spiritual advisor and his political confidant. But Calderón wanted her to return to Spain and, and, and found a religious order in a convent that he had purchased in Valladolid. She turned him down firmly but tactfully. Whenever our Lord wishes me to leave England, it will be a great comfort and joy to go to your convent. Instead, she tells him how she wants to be buried when she dies. If I die a martyr and the parts of my body are gathered, your Lordship may place it where it will be well received giving some part to the English Jesuit novitiate in Flanders, founded by the poor rent that I gave them. If I do not die a martyr, then I do not deserve to be buried. I have received infinite and most extraordinary mercies from God, being the most miserable person one can imagine, and I do not give signs of improvement so as to worry about my burial. These words, with which she effectively tells him he may have her only when dead, turns out to be prescient, as we shall see. In 1613, Luisa was again jailed. This time she was accused of operating a convent in her house. The Archbishop of Canterbury gave orders to have over 60 men on foot and on horseback break into her house. She was incarcerated with accused heretics and common criminals in the public jail. When the Spanish ambassador angrily wrote King James demanding her release, she was freed after four days. The Spanish king, Philip III, however, had already signed a resolution recalling Carvajal to Spain. Predicting the king's decision, Luisa wrote her last letter, or at least the last letter that we have, to the king's, to the king's favorite, the Duke of Lerma, beseeching him not to listen to those who demanded her departure from England. The letter's pleading tone does not hide the fact that she was communicating directly with the most powerful man in Spain. By stating that her vocation as a missionary and her suffering in England were always a part of God's plan, she is telling the Duke and indirectly the King that they must respect her wishes. Nevertheless, both Philip's resolution and her letter to the Duke were written too late. Her imprisonment in jail had exacerbated her ill health and triggered a bronchial infection that kept her bedridden for two months until her death in 1614. This illness would later be designated the main justification for her sainthood, since she contracted the disease while in jail, causing her to die a martyr in the service of the faith. <laughs> However, that category that she so desperately longed for, that of martyr, remained officially beyond her reach. 
she was never canonized a saint. The traffic and relics in which Luisa de Carvajal took part ironically prefigured the exchange of her own remains from England to Spain. The Jesuits did not obey her will to be buried at the novitiate in Flanders. Instead, once her death became known, a veritable tug of war broke out among the different groups who wished to reap the benefits of her potential sanctity. The English Catholics believed that God had sent Luisa to console them, either dead or alive, and wanted to keep the body in London. Philip, however, ordered that her body be sent to the convent of the Incarnation, which had been founded in Madrid by his recently deceased wife, Margaret of Austria. The contest of wills between her and the English and Spanish male hierarchy continued to play out over her corpse. The Spanish ambassador kept her body in England for over a year. When it was finally shipped to Spain, the king sent Rodrigo Calderón to receive it at the port of San Sebastián. But Calderón had already, was already locked in a battle with the king that would topple him and his patron, the Duke of Lerma. Already anticipating his fall, he kidnapped Luisa's corpse and took it to his convent in Valladolid. An irate King Philip demanded that Calderón release the body for its final deposit at the convent of the Incarnation, where it remains today as one more relic among many. The disparities between what Luisa de Carvajal construed as her desires and their fulfillment as a woman, yet at the same time an aristocrat, illuminate the unresolved tensions of gender and class that at once defined and delimited female subjectivity in early modern Spain. Thank you. I brought your book, okay? I'm going to leave it up here. Yeah, you know. So I'm sorry. No, no, that's big giving me up at the mic. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, our second uh, speaker tonight, Pamela Hammonds, professor and chair of English at the University of Miami, is editor of Catherine Austin's book, M, A London Widow's Life Writings. Austin lived later than Louisa in the 17th century during the dramatic upheavals of England's civil wars through the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 as well as the deadly outbreak of the plague in 1665 and the fire of London in 1666. A scholar of early modern English manuscript culture, poetry, women's writing, and theories of genre and sexuality, Pam is the author of Gender, Sexuality, and Material Objects in the English Renaissance Verse, 2010, and Poetic Resistance, English Women Writers and the Early Modern Lyric, 2002, as well as many articles on early modern literature and culture. She is a recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities in support of her research. Please welcome Pam to the podium. Okay, well, hello everybody and thank you for coming. Um, to start, um, I'm going to have Emma pass out a couple of copies of my book just so that people can see what it looks like. So feel free just to look at it and, and page through it. It'll help you get a sense of what the volume is. Um, thanks very much to the University of Miami Center for the Humanities and uh, Mihoko and Books and Books for coordinating and hosting this event. And um, also to my colleagues in the Center's Early Modern Research Group, many of whom are here tonight, and many of whom also provided feedback on this volume along the way. Um, Book M, A London Widow's Life Writings, is a modernized transcription of a unique handwritten 17th century manuscript. Um, I'm going to give you some context about it, and then I'm going to show you some, some pictures, some images from the manuscript so that you get a sense of what it looks like. So for me, this was a project of transcription, um, whereas for Anne, she was doing a project of translation, right? But they're still part of the same series. Um, I also want to um, give some attention to this edition, uh, Catherine Austin's book M, um, as edited by Sarah C.E. Ross, a colleague in New Zealand. This is a scholarly diplomatic transcription. So this one um, keeps every single um, 
spelling every single mark true, but in print. Okay, so this is, this is what scholars would use if they couldn't get to the, to the manuscript itself. This is for a general reader, and so they're very different kinds of projects. Um, but, but Sarah and I have communicated about both of them for several years along the way. So it's good to have a colleague on the other side of the earth working on the same thing. <laughs> um, so this volume makes accessible to today's reader the personal writings of Catherine Austin, who lived from 1628 to 1683. Austin was in her 30s and was an upwardly mobile widow and single mother of three living in London when she penned the manuscript she called Book M, which serves as a rich resource for understanding early modern women's writing, especially their poetry. It includes Austin's spiritual meditations, sermon notes, financial records, letters, personal essays, and more than 30 occasional and religious lyrics, such as psalms, elegies, and country house verse. In Book M, she reveals her fascination with historical and literary figures, such as Queen Elizabeth I, Hildegard of Bingen, the classical Sibyls, Henry IV, Charles II, the Odyssey's Penelope, and numerous biblical figures. Her writings suggest that she was an avid reader. She was familiar with the conventions of many literary genres and clearly knew the Psalms thoroughly, as well as works by Ben Jonson, John Donne, William Shakespeare, Walter Raleigh, Isaac Walton, and many, many Anglican divines of her day. She wrote and compiled her book primarily between 1664 and 1666, but it has entries dated as late as 1682, which suggests that she returned to it periodically, reading, editing, and amending it. Because she interspersed her poems among her other life writings, her manuscript gives us a rare glimpse of the importance poetic composition had to an ambitious 17th century widow whose everyday concerns focus primarily upon managing her finances, educating her children, and providing for their future, and avoiding the considerable dangers of the era, including smallpox, the plague, and the Great Fire of London. <laughs> she not only connects important historical events to her own life and to family members in Book M, but she also vividly relates wide-ranging anecdotes and opinions, her own and other people's, about the rich, famous, and infamous queens and emperors, poets and prophets, friends and foes. Austin's writing is in a unique quarto volume, and you see an image of it there, open. Uh, additional manuscript 4454, which is held today by the British Library in London. Book M is entirely in her own handwriting and was not intended for print publication for a mass audience. She authored most of Book M, but she also copied, summarized, and adapted material from other sources, often without attribution. Until recently, scholars of the early modern period have tended to overlook the vital importance of the manuscript circulation of texts during the 16th and 17th centuries in England. The printing press with movable type was introduced into England in 1476, a century and a half before Austin's birth. However, the advent of print did not mean that people simply abandoned the long-standing practice of manuscript publication. Instead, a new print culture developed alongside and intermingled with a pre-existing manuscript culture. Manuscript and print were socially marked forms of textual transmission that influenced how people read the contents of a work. Printing one's writing for a broad readership was thought by some to be demeaning or vulgar because it meant exposing one's ideas to the common masses. From the elite perspective, printed texts could thus carry negative connotations. The notion that printing one's words was a form of intimate personal exposure to a mass population also linked it to the idea that it signaled a lack of chastity in women. Since chastity was pervasively represented as the single most important female virtue, indeed as the foundation of all other female virtues, it could jeopardize a woman's reputation for upstanding moral behavior for her to print her writing. By contrast, for her to share her ideas with friends and family members through manuscript transmission was seen as far more proper. In fact, some families encouraged this practice. For women and men alike, circulating texts through manuscript transmission was more prestigious than printing them. It's also important to keep in mind that the capacity for mass distribution inherent in print publication did not lead directly to significant financial gain for writers. There was no authorial copyright, and writers sold their works to booksellers and printers outright for a low price. Writers in 16th and 17th century England did not make money primarily by printing and selling multiple copies of their books. So Austen's not the only 17th century author who did not write to make money from her literary efforts or to publicize her ideas to the greatest possible number of readers. Instead, 
as in the case of many of her contemporaries, male and female, her writing practices were, on one hand, contemplative activities that helped her to understand herself in relation to the mundane and spiritual worlds, and on the other, forms of social engagement that reinforced her personal connections to her family and local community. Perhaps in an age of electronic social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, and personal blogs, it's becoming easier for us to recognize why someone would choose to write prolifically, strategically, and with deliberate craft and imagination without doing so primarily to sell books. Perhaps our electronic writing practices today can help us understand how writing as a member of a locally restricted community, or coterie, can support in reassuring ways one's sense of personal, personal identity and how and where one fits into the world. In addition to giving her readers a carefully controlled perspective on Austen herself, Book M reveals compelling glimpses of other texts that were especially important to her. Throughout Book M, for example, Austen includes cross-references to other books. In some cases, those books were authored by other people, but she also refers to books designed by, uh, designated by other letters of the alphabet that were probably her own. Thus, Book M was almost certainly one of many such books Austen wrote and compiled across her lifetime. According to what we currently know, those other books, A to L and After M, are now tragically lost. If Austen named Book M as she did to catalog it among her other writings, then she'd probably been an active writer for many years before the day in 1664 when she opened a new book and began to pen Book M on its pristine blank pages. Indeed, her inclusion of introductory pages, giving her book a title and a table of contents, indicates her experience with reading and writing and the deliberate care that went into her creation of Book M. In all likelihood, Austen was an even more prolific writer and an even more important chronicler of a remarkable century than Book M alone reveals her to be. In opening this single precious surviving volume, we enter Austen's fascinating life story in media stress and can only speculate about what we've uh, most unfortunately lost before and after M. So that's the context. And now I'm gonna spend a little time talking about some of the actual um, images here. So I mentioned that she provides a textual apparatus. Um, so here you see um, her title page and it says Book M. Oops. This is her signature page. So you see her, her signature there near the top of the screen, Catherine Austin, 1664. Then you see that she actually took the time to, to very carefully to leave space in the front of the book for a table of contents. And um, at times, this table of contents shows that although this is actually quite tidy and professional looking, indicating that she really knows her stuff in terms of um, looking at other books and so forth, that every now and then she um, makes a mistake that needs to be corrected. So in, top, in the top line there, it says table, and then the, the first entry is of angels. And then you see the number nine in, the, in addition to the number one. So clearly on page nine, she um, had another entry that could fit that same title and went ahead and marked it. At the bottom of the page, you get um, numbers 42 and 47. But at the top of the next, the first entry is 44. Right, so the, the likelihood there is that she um, forgot an entry and had to, to find a way to squeeze it in and put it as close as she possibly could um, to where it should go as tidily as possible, right? So you see 42, 47, 44. Some of the entries have two numbers because the, she um, uses the same titles more than once. Um, I'm gonna say a little something about her writing practice. Um, in the first third of the book, she tends only to write on what we think of as the right-hand side of the page, or the recto folio. And so she tends to see, leave the left-hand side blank. And that means that when I show you this next image, um, she continued that essay at the top of this um, right-hand side. Okay, so that it says Doc Hammond's dream. This was um, a, an Anglican divine that she was fascinated with. There's a catch word at the bottom, the which, the, and then W um, with a superscript CH, and then which is at the top of this, um, this side of the page. On the other side, she went back and clearly reread um, this account of Doc Hammond's dream and then added these other little stories about dreams and so forth. She was very fascinated with dreams. Um, so I'm gonna pause to read you a little bit. Apparently I don't understand how to use this thing. Whoops, there we go. 
um, from Doc Hammond's dream, which is actually quite dramatic. And so I'll read you the modernized version of what you're looking at. Okay, so I'm going to read from about two-thirds of the page. And this is what it says, Doc Hammond's dream. About the beginning of the Troubles, 1643, when ministers was put out of their livings, though he was no valuer of trifles or anything that looked like such, he had so extraordinary a dream he could not then despise nor ever after forget it. He thought himself and a multitude of others to have been abroad in a bright and cheerful day when on a sudden there seemed a separation to be made, and he with the far less number to be placed at a distance from the rest. And then clouds gathering a most tempestuous storm arose with thunder and lightnings, with spouts of impetuous rain and violent gusts of wind. And what else might add to a scene of horror, particular bar balls of fire that shot themselves in among the ranks of those that stood in the lesser party, when a gentle whisper seemed to interrupt those other louder noises saying, be still and you shall receive no harm, which is the sentence two thirds down the page that's kind of set, set aside a little bit. Okay, so that's, that's part of Doc Hammond's dream, and that gives you a sense of what she was interested in. And then if you look at what looks like the third paragraph on the far side away from me, where she went back at, um, and reread her work and was kind of creating her own glosses or footnotes um, and following her ideas, that third entry there says the following, a man was murdered. One cut off his hand and hung it up in the castle of Cambridge. Some 10 or 20 years after he that murdered him came into the castle and by accident touched that dry hand and it bled. <laughs> he confessed and was hanged. It was thought the soul of the murdered lay in the hand until the murderer appeared. Okay, so that she clearly has an interest in this stuff. And right be below what I read, you might be able to make out the fact that it says 1682 Sir Edward Thurland, right? So that marks the latest date that appears. So clearly she was going back and rereading her own stuff and thinking about it. Okay, um, so that's kind of just some comments on how she put this book together. Um, on the far side of the page, there's actually a cross-reference. When I was talking a few minutes ago, I mentioned that she did this. So um, about two-thirds down, there's a little X right here. That X is referred to um, on the other side of the page, it says book A, and then that X, and then it cites where one can go and find more information. So she creates her own cross-references as well. So she really has an interest in creating a full textual apparatus. So to make it clear, this really isn't like what a person would think of as a diary today. Um, okay, so um, part of what's interesting about this book is it intersperses poems with other kinds of texts. And so her poems show that she's aware of literary genres, she's using forms of craft in writing her poetry, but she also puts them in relation to other texts spatially in such a way that the text, the poem, and, and prose writings, for instance, comment on each other, so they create a dialogue between each other. Um, this one I want to show you because when I first saw it, I was really kind of struck by the oddity of the title, Poem 18, um, On My Fall Off the Tree. <laughs> because that's what you really expect a middle-aged woman uh, to be doing in, in 17th century England. And so I wondered, you know, really, what on earth is this about? And it's about her falling out of a tree. <laughs> so she explains, she explains what she was doing in the tree and how she fell. And then this poem actually suggests that um, divine providence saves her in a very dramatic way. She actually falls off, um, loses consciousness. Two ladies come and find her. It's really very dramatic. But anyway, so... Um, she really meant that she fell off a tree. Um, her family was concerned about um, gaining possession of an of a estate, and that estate was called Highbury. She wrote many texts throughout the volume about Highbury. It was an ongoing concern. Um, this is one example of a collection of texts that are written about this particular estate, so that at the, the far side away, away from me, um, there's a, a sort of prose meditation on finally getting the estate. Just beneath it, there's a poem kind of being thankful about getting the estate. And then on the other page, there's a poem on the situation of Highbury, which is the most secular poem in the collection. It's a country house poem and shows the range of writing, uh, sorry, the, the range of writing that she probably read. Um, and you can tell that she wants it associated with those other two texts, but she also gives it a lot of space. So visually, she sees that one as important enough to get an entire page. Um, as she does in this, the case of this poem, which she um, numbers her third, on the death of my um, niece, uh, Grace Ash, four years old. Um, the other, the prose piece that's facing it, is on the death of a wide range of friends and family. 
um, some from smallpox, some from other, other um, ailments and so forth. So they're both meditating on death, but the one that's on um, her niece who is four years old gets a lot of attention again spatially with the, the presentation. Um, there are no revisions on that, on, on that particular poem. It's the most metrically complex poem that she included in the entire um, book. And um, she probably, that's probably a copy of something that she wrote out and circulated to other family members. So she's probably keeping for herself a poem that she gave to others as process, the, part of the process of mourning. Okay, so this one I wanted you guys to see because it is, it actually consists of financial notes. Um, even though it announces at the top that it's on meditation. It's, it's a meditation. But it turns out that um, as you keep reading, and she's meditating on um, the sickness and Highbury, as you read down, she, you'll, you'll notice the sorts of things that she's paying attention to financially. The numbers and the columns on the side of each page are all pounds. Um, and so she's giving quantities where she can. But some of these are very bitter in entries. About half the way down to the far page, you've got uh, Mr. Cruz's cheat, a tenant's cheat. You've also got the vexatious suit of a tenant. So she was kind of irritated when she wrote this. Um, um, some of her interests, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, extend to other historical figures. And this is an interesting juxtaposition when you have the book open because the far side is an anecdote about Queen Elizabeth I. Then the next page is on Hildegard of Bingen and she's got them juxtaposed together next to, next to each other. Um, and her, Her story about, um, well, I guess I should, I should leave it for people who might be interested in, in looking at the book at some point, but her story about Queen Elizabeth involves um, a courtier seeking pardon from Queen Elizabeth by riding his horse in the sea to find her where she was on a boat and making his horse go around her, the boat three times and then delivering his petition to her. Um, and then she pardons him. He takes this miraculous horse, swims with it back to the shore and kills it because it was such an evil cr creature to um, enable her to, to pardon um, somebody who didn't deserve it. Then later he comes back to that same beach and the horse he's on um, throws him off and he dies. So it's, it's actually, it's supposed to be about Elizabeth, but that's what that actually says there. Okay. Um, and just to, to finish up, I'm going to read one poem that I'm not showing you here. Um, it's very brief, and this just gives you an example of, of what her poetic writing sounds like. Um, what makes me melancholy? What black cloud does interrupt, uh, intercept my peace, does me enshroud, and entertains me with the shades of night? Is all thy splendored favors darkened quite? Where is the signal smiles did off display? In great eclipses, joy did reconvey those radiant marks, which, when I sat alone, did seem a heaven so much glory shone. And am I now enveloped in fear and former ravishments forget to hear? O oh God, my sin, tis my declining soul flies from thy altar to the world's does roll. A lethe stupefaction from that snare creating much unnecessary care. Restore me, Jesu, that, that live saving balm as these discordances may ever calm. So I'll leave you with that. Folks, we have some time left for questions. I don't know if Professor Hammonds and Professor Cruz would like to come back up to the podium. Oh, you're going to take questions over there. Okay, perfect. No, that's correct. You're right. All right, so yes. Oops, thank you. so different and but I saw a lot of you know the uh the interest in the body and the supernatural you know Pam you were talking about the, the bleeding of the right uh, the, when the guilty person comes and then the relics and and also the poem you read you know shows a real deep religiosity I think and so they and, and She's also very secular, but she, you know, with her accounts, <laughs> her <laughs> angry. Yeah. And she was an investor too, right? She was. Yeah. 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 So, so that's a very so multifaceted uh, picture we get from the book. Yeah. But so, 
Any questions for either or both of the speakers? Suzanne? Um, yes, Anne, I have a question. Um, I was just curious as to to which degree, perhaps in your research, that you may have found that um, Louisa might have been persecuted in England because of her gender, or was it more that her Catholicism and the radicality of her Catholicism relative to the Protestant? Well, it was a obviously it was a combination of both. She was a Spaniard, and so therefore in England, I mean, we, if, if she had been a man, they would have gone after her as well. But, you know, paradoxically, she could do more in England than she could ever have done in Spain. Because in England, she went out on the streets and, and preached, um, you know, talked to people um, about, about Catholic doctrine, tried to, tried to con you know, convert them, which was probably something that in Spain, thanks to St. Paul, uh, they would not have, pro they wouldn't have been very happy to see a woman, no, no matter at what level of society she was at, doing something like that. So it's very, you know, the gender issue, I'm glad you brought that up because it is very complex. It's not just, well, she's a woman, therefore she was being attacked. It was, it was uh, you know, she had power because she was a woman on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, she was also, um, she, they, masculine, they masculinized her is what they did in, in England. You know, they said she, she, was, she, act, she acted like a man. Um, so. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Um, I'm thinking about both uh, Louisa and Catherine's writings that deal a lot with violence. So Louisa's mm -hmm. preoccupation with being a martyr, right? And also Catherine's recordings of beheadings or, you know, the violent fall from a tree, her own vexations, etc. And I was wondering, in your um, common research fields, have you considered, like, maybe found out some parts where a female's, uh, female representations of violence or expressions of violent images have a unique sensibility that's particularly female or... How do they deal with violence in when it comes to children? Well, um, I just finished writing a paper on a uh, comparison of, 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 of Mar um, Margaret, Mar Mar Marguerite de Navarre, who took a story by Boccaccio. And, uh, and, and you see that Boccaccio's stories were very, you know, they weren't at all as violent. And she really increases the violence tremendously in the story. So it could be, I don't know, Pam, if you, if you would, you know, if you think maybe it's the time, you know, it could be the time. I mean, 16th and 17th century, Europe in general was extremely violent. So I don't know. Yeah, and, and um, just thinking about this particular uh, manuscript, I think um, what strikes me is that Austin was interested in drama. And so she was interested in um, happenings, especially in her own life, that suggested that her life had divine purpose and that she was in the middle of a sort of cosmic battle between good and evil. So mm -hmm. for a lot, of her, the, a lot of the moments that may come across as violent in her writing have to do with that. Um, mm -hmm. And interestingly, she was, I think in the way that probably a lot of us would be, was really terrified of a lot of the ways a person could die in her time period. You know, so she was very scared of the smallpox and the plague. And um, so I, she did not want to be a martyr. That's, I mean, that's one <laughs> thing that they didn't have in common. She was, um, yeah, <laughs> like does yeah. Not want to, that's, yeah, that's already too bad. So, um, so I'm not sure that there's anything that's, um, especially gendered about that for her. Um, it may have to do with her social status. I just want her to say a little bit more because one of the things that when I read your book I picked up on immediately was the fact that she was a widow but she refused to marry afterwards. And I wanted you to say a little bit about that. Okay, well thank you. She, um, again she was in her, she was probably 36 when she started writing this particular volume and she had three children and um, she struggled with the question of whether she should marry again. And there are a few entries um, in Book M where she talks about a suitor and expresses concern about what she should do. Um, and in the end she decides, well, she, she makes it clear that she's worried about what will happen to her property. Mm -hmm. 
um, and what she'll be able to control in the way of her children's inheritance if she were to remarry. So she's very concerned about that, about her children with her, her husband, Thomas Austin. And there are lots of indicators that she really loved the husband who, um, who died. So there's that. The other thing is he died of the plague, the suitor. Um, so, <laughs> so, that was, yeah. Is this a Scottish? The, the yeah, Scot yes, okay. this, is the, this is a Scottish suitor. And okay. yeah, so she, she buys him a um, plot and a <laughs> memorial. So, um, so who knows if he had made it through the plague, you know, I don't know. But, but she did struggle with it and, and um, registered that repeatedly in Book M. Nobody knows for sure, and the best guess is really that it may be a way that she was cataloging her books. So it may have been cataloging a personal library where some of them were books that she wrote um, and some weren't, or it may really be that she wrote book A starting when she was a teenager and worked her way all the way up to M by the time she was in her mid-30s, and, and we just don't know. Yeah. And also about the handwriting, is that I haven't, well, it's English too, but I haven't really seen handwriting like that. Is that typical for women at that period? Yeah, that pretty much for, um, for this period in 17th century England. Um, yeah. So it's a, the, the handwriting's not unusual. Yeah. On the format, is, um, it almost seems encyclopedic the way she approaches this. And it, it interspersed with all this other information, poetry, writing, and documentation. Is this something common in the area, or is this unique to her uh, from that time? Well, I mean, people did have a tendency to collect documents in manuscript books. And so, um, in fact, there's a, a kind of book called a commonplace book where people would um, collect writings. So if they were to find a poem by somebody else that they really liked, then they would copy it down. And then maybe they would write a letter to somebody and they'd need a copy of that and then copy that in their book. So um, manuscript writing and compilation of texts is really quite different from what people think of today as a book. Question for Anne. Since uh, we find that uh, Louisa was very much interested in martyrdom, did she write about a famous English martyr, more or less a contemporary of Mary, Queen of Scots, in any of her writings? No, no, I haven't heard anything about, well, uh, toward the end, when she was when she was um, being questioned about her religion, she did say that uh, the idea at the time was that that Mary, Queen of Scots, would have probably have been a better queen than Queen Elizabeth because she was first of all she was legitimate, secondly, <laughs> secondly she was a Catholic, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> so of course, you know, so in in that regard. But she does say an awful lot against Queen Elizabeth. You know, she calls her you know that viper, that horrible woman, the killer of the killer of the Jesuits. She calls her she calls Queen Elizabeth that, and of course she wants Isabel Claro Henia, you know, to actually take over the throne, um, which she could have. I mean, there was you know there there's some there's some <coughs> ascendancy there that that could have worked. A question for Anne. Thank you for the storytelling. That was brilliant. <laughs> that was really, really yeah, entertaining okay. to, to tell the story of um, Garbahad. But I actually have a question about your process of translation. Yeah. What was the biggest challenge when you were translated into English? Did you think about making it uh, as close as possible to early modern English, or are you modernizing the translation? No, the, the translation is pretty modern, but the hardest thing for me was the, her poetry. Because I, I didn't speak at all about her poetry, but she has she has fifty poems. She was an excellent, excellent. I mean, she critics have called her the best the best poet of the seventeenth century. It's just that it's not very there's not very much of them. There's about fifty poems, but she she knows all of the different kinds. She knows the sonnets. She knows the she knows the octava rima. She does the, the uh, ballad poetry. So she's very much in control of. Of, of the of the poems, but the poems are about as violent <laughs> as um, a little bit about as as her, as her life. They were they were very very hard, very hard to translate because I didn't because I wanted to keep the rhyme, not not the not not the um, not not the rhyme at the end obviously, but at least you know the the, the, meter. the meter. I wanted to, yeah I kept the meter. I tried to keep the meter, so it was hard. Anyone else 
else have any questions? One last question, okay. We have one more. Sure, sure. Yes, this is for um, both or either. Um, I'm really interested in the recusant communities in, in London, or especially the very beginning of the 17th century. And it just seems like there's so much less about that that's accessible to the non-historian like me. But um, I keep wondering how they lived uh, after, say, they were fined by the queen, they were discovered as Catholics, and they were but, you know, disinherited. Where did they go? Did they did they mm -hmm. live with relatives? Did they um, these big old families with a lot of money? Did they end up in dire poverty? Like what what happened to these families? Well, uh, the Catholics lived help. <laughs> the Ca Catholics lived in the nor north northern England, so the, so you know they're. They were more protected up there than there they were a, definitely. There was a series of safe houses for Catholics, for Catholics where they would pass, and when the royal inspectors would come around, they would be they would usually be tipped off and moved from one safe house to another and another. Sometimes they were discovered, sometimes they were able to continue up yeah. until the time James came in, and James initially was tolerant to the Catholics up until the gunpowder plot, as has been mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And then there were priests. Right, so yes, the there, yes, the famous priest yeah. hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there were many Jesuits that came into England, though. I mean, I think that you know it almost sounds you know counterintuitive, but they, but but there were a lot of uh, of, of Jesuits that you know that 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 circulated, and three, uh, no, three three of the of the. Um, uh, novitiates were in s the English ca the English colleges were as you probably know in Spain right there's I mean Valladolid still has one St Albans you know the English College of St Albans you know which was Jesuit when Luisa de Carvajal was there but is now is now belongs to another an uh, another denomination um, so yeah can I see one more hand in the back or someone raising a hand no all right perhaps one last question anyone. Well, all right, then, if there are no more questions, uh, note to our internet audience watching at home, all of our events uh, here are archived. So if you don't get to watch the event live, you could go to the Books and Books website, go to the live streaming link, and any event that's been broadcast from here at the store will be saved there for you to watch at your convenience. For those of you here at the house tonight, I have an apology to make. We had a problem with delivery. So if you are interested in a copy of The Life and Writings of Luisa de Carvajal y Mendoza or Book M, A London Widow's Life Writings, we will happily take an order for you at the counter over there on the other side of the curtain. But we do not actually have them up there at the counter for sale this evening. My apologies to you. Um, I want to thank uh, our friend Professor Miyoko Suzuki for hosting the event tonight, and please let's give a hand to Professor Cruz and Professor Hammonds. Thank you very much. Thank you.